Hi there, this is Filippi. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to present this paper, which is part of my ongoing PhD research about waste prevention and generous cities. I'm not that happy with the fact that I'm doing so remotely instead of being with you all in Bali. But as it turns out, I have 40 days to finish my thesis, so I figured it would be best if I remained here in Berlin. My research is part of this project called Open Dot, which stands for the Open Design of Trusted Things, in which five research fellows were selected from different parts of the world to work in different aspects of the Internet of Things with a special focus on open design, uh, trust, privacy and internet health. It was this cooperation between the University of Northumbria in Newcastle and the Mozilla Foundation here in Berlin. The project lasts three years, uh, most of which during COVID times. Last July, we submitted all the, you know, the, the, the last work package, the last deliverables. And since then, I've been working more in finishing my thesis, as I mentioned. This, present, this paper presents part of the activities I performed during the project, particularly uh, connected to the last batch that was supposed to work in an articulation between our research and policy making. Uh, Five, the five of us had different research topics. Mine was smart cities, but let me start being very clear on the smart city thing. Uh, I don't like uh, most of everything I read about smart cities, so I'm really critical of it. This was an image search on smart cities uh, done a couple of days ago, early this week. And uh, you would need to scroll down dozens, may maybe hundreds of images before you saw any image of real people. That's part of the way the smart cities narrative is constructed. It's a vision of disembodied cities with code infrastructure that only needs better IT, you know, these light connections, uh, to be properly managed. All lean, fast and easy. And my question you know, is whether that is a true depiction. There is quite a lot of uh, very interesting critical scholarship dedica dedicated to criticize the smart city narrative. Here are some of the authors who have been exploring this critical perspective. I am particularly drawn to those interested in discussing how technologies uh, connect to literature on urban studies, particularly around the idea of the right to the city, along the lines proposed by Henri Lefebvre and David Harvey and other authors. Uh, to lay it out as briefly as possible, this critical take, smart cities are usually lacking in democratic participation in terms of concrete decision making as well as in exercising imagination about what a city can be. Uh, smart cities tend to assume that all of mankind wants to live in cities that look like these images and that it's only a matter of increasing the efficiency of urban services to have everything solved. There is little discussion even about what efficiency even means uh, for local populations. That perspective, that, that perspective may be even more relevant to me considering my background. I am from Brazil in South America. I lived around Sao Paulo for about two decades. And uh, to my sensibility, cities are often sites of conflict, inequality, contradictions, and an unbalanced exercise of power. And the solutions for that are not necessarily technology. You may have seen this next image that I'll show. I've been using it for, in presentations since some years, and I was glad recently to meet the author, the photographer here in Berlin. Tuka Vieira is his name. Uh, he shot this photo from above. It looks like a collage, but uh, it's not. It's actually a real neighborhood in Sao Paulo. And scenes like this are not uncommon. This may be a, a, a great picture, but this kind of, uh, of dynamics is usually common in cities like Sao Paulo. So you have a very rich neighborhood surrounded by a very poor neighborhood with no infrastructure. Uh, Professor Lorenzo Mami, uh, Lorenzo Mami, sorry, uh, wrote about this image, uh, and I tried to translate it like uh, hoarding on one side, wasting on the other. I guess uh, it's up to debate which is which. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the, the best translation. The original in Portuguese, in Portuguese says, acumulo de um lado, desperdício do outro. Although it is common to translate desperdício as waste, the English form seems to be insufficient. So desperdício comes from the verb desperdiçar, from the verb desperdiçar, that is to waste. And I saw suggestions, uh, you know, in translation help websites about using wastage 
but I decided to insist here on wasting, so hoarding on one side, wasting on the other. And I made this, this, this choice about using wasting um, to use this, you know, using this, this privilege of being a non-native English speaker, so uh, I, I will allow myself to sound weird and not worry about it. But I want to emphasize is this shift in understanding of waste as a noun, you know, waste being an object, into wasting as an action. And my research focuses, uh, in a sense, in that. So in the first months of my PhD research, more than three years ago, I started paying attention to scenes like this one. This one was shot in Dundee, where he moved for the first part of the project. And I had, uh, that drew my attention because I had a significant experience in waste and reuse and uh, solid waste legislation and policy before that. And I had even, you know, hands-on experience, quite literally. I was one of the founders of the Meta Recyclaging Network, which collected donated computers and installed Linux and refurbished them and gave them away to social projects in Brazil that last for about a decade. Then I was also a member of the Cultura Digital project that explored more experimental uses of digital uh, tools and critical making and open networks. And then I spent some time also investigating practices of repair reuse and the connection that may had with that may have with craft so these images and this uh, these two and the next ones are from this short period that i spent in qatar some years ago exploring what happened to waste in a very rich and unequal country um no oh, sorry move back oh these are all in the desert and then i spent also some time uh collaborating with different projects. This was an event in Nantes, in France, where they had this community repair uh, workshop, and then there was this event on circular economy that had a kind of different take on circular economy. And then I have also my background in collaborating and trying to help cooperatives in Brazil. This is a uh, uh, waste pickers, waste collectors cooperative in Ubatuba, the city I used to live where they are in the middle of the forest and they don't have any support, any infrastructure. And what they do is to collect recyclable materials and to export it outside. But these are the things that happen when you have a market-based, uh, you know, attempt to solve the problems related to waste. These three terms, uh, so they are often uh, mentioned when we talk about waste, but then uh, people don't pay a lot of attention to the fact that there is a an, an hierarchy uh, expected to those terms. So we should be first reducing, then reusing, and then only finally recycling. And then when it comes to waste management in smart city projects, it's usually about increasing the level or improving the efficiency to increase the level of recyclable collection. And that is not sustainable in the long run. We are totally sure that you know contemporary cities will generate excess, and uh, but the context of a global climate emergency makes it even more vital to preserve resources to make them be used for as long as possible. I hope everyone in this audience is aware, but recycling is not a magical solution. It is an industrial process that requires logistics, sometimes really long distance logistics. It has physical limitations in terms of the, the, the chemical elements and the materials that can even be uh, recycled. It reduces the value of matter. So if you have something and send it to recycling, it, uh, the, the, the value will be reduced, has been pointed by, by Braungart and uh, McDonald uh, in uh, Cradle to Cradle. Uh, and, I, and also recycling is costly and it generates a lot of environmental impact. So there are systems-based perspectives such as the circular economy that I mentioned and cradle to cradle that try to address the situation, but even on the uh, highly unlikely possibility that all of the industrial production adopting 100% of circular processes, there are at this moment billions of products out there that have already been manufactured they are in use and they are just waiting to be considered waste. A significant proportion of these objects and materials can still be used. Their raw materials have been extracted and transformed. They have a carbon footprint already and premature recycling will cut short the value they still may hold. In addition to the circular economy, there are other themes facing recently 
uh, that, that are recently drawing attention that could contribute to it. So there are teams like uh, the idea of a donut economy, zero waste, and part of the, the discourse around a Green New Deal. So these kinds of policies are contributing to uh, draw attention to waste and how we should solve this, this, these issues. But there is not much uh, into deconstructing the assumption according to which waste management is merely making unwanted materials disappear from the public eye as quickly as possible. So when I started my research uh, in 2019, I set out to understand what was happening. So I organized two design research studies in the first year in which I explored uh, individuals and household behavior towards discarded or broken or unwanted things. And also I, I started an ecosystem mapping in order to understand what kinds of structures were there in cities that could contribute to uh, tackle the, the amount of waste or potentially usable materials that were being transformed into waste. So in this first year, I have shifted from trying to interact with the with the the universe of waste management in smart cities and drifting away from it and talking more about waste prevention instead of waste management. Because if you think about waste management, you already consider those materials to be waste. And when you talk about waste prevention, which is uh, usually understood as a better investment, even in, in terms of uh, financial investment to solutions. If you talk about waste prevention, there are many other possibilities that in which the material is not yet considered waste. So my question, the, the question that emerged from this first batch of research was how to understand and how to assess the potential value of materials. So I set out and created eight design concepts that try to create uh, different kinds of responses to that. And I focused particularly on three ways to to promote the, this perspective of waste prevention. Uh, I would be thinking in community-based practices of reuse, and reuse would be understood like repair, or in, in, in different aspects of repair, upcycling, and recirculation of materials. I fell into the idea of transformation of matter as a kind of alternative discourse to making, or to fabrication, sorry, just bumped into the microphone here. Uh, and the idea of excess started to, to appear in my research. So how do you deal with excess in a contemporary city? Then I did this open design lab on the internet in which a lot of people, uh, almost 30 people subscribed or registered. And um, I would say there were 11 or 12 active participants during a month in which we explored different ideas. And I was trying to prototype three speculative ideas about how to tackle the issues related to waste. So the first one was the Universal Registry of Things or Thing Wiki, that would be a database, an open database with open protocols in which information about how to reuse materials and objects and products would be shared across industries. The second would be a machine, a kind of machine to evaluate the potential, uh, the potential of reuse of different objects and materials. And the third would be a blueprint for a transformation lab that came from my critical view, critical perspective on makerspaces and fab labs, which I consider that in the beginning, like 15 years ago, they elaborated a lot more in the discourse about the reuse and repair. And more recently, I saw a higher permeability to commercial entrepreneurship and uh, industrial practices and not that much focus into reusing materials and into the environmental aspects, environmental implications of using all of these technologies. So coming back to it, excess is always uh, part of my research. It had been before I even started the PhD, but now I decided to focus my attention more into it. And then I started exploring how to deal with excess. So my first take was to think about abundance. So if we think about excess being a source of abundance for cities, and then we could try to, to understand, to identify the potential value of materials and revert that to local societies. But abundance, after a note by a, 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 a colleague in a panel, uh, she made this comment about abundance being kind of passive and there is no intention and abundance can be also wasteful. 
So I decided to think about, to think in terms of generosity. So generosity would be an intentional way to transform excess into, uh, into resources for others. So there's a, a kind of care involved. There is in the intention to help other people. And then I started using that framing to talk about what I saw the solutions for uh, waste could be. So it would be about generating ways to prevent uh, waste through uh, transforming excess into generosity. Then um, I figured after learning more about projects that happened in different parts of the world, I decided not to focus on a, blim uh, on a blueprint as uh, I had uh, experimented with in the second year uh, in, with the idea of transformation labs, but finally to think about uh, reuse commons. That was another of my original design concepts. And um, the idea is to think that cities are essentially makerspaces. So every city has a lot of equipment, it has a lot of knowledge, it has a lot of materials already being transformed and being adapted. And we should try to think of that as a resource. So instead of creating a new kind of infrastructure in which people could reuse their materials, could repair their broken objects, could uh, uh, recirculate materials, we could try to identify uh, the structures that are already installed in cities. So thinking of cities as transformation labs, thinking of cities as makerspaces. And that has even more advantages because you have, not only you have equipment that is already installed, for instance, in, I don't know, bike repair shops, in woodworking workshops, in, and even uh, structure like uh, hardware stores and, and other kinds of interesting places of both material but also knowledge uh, exchange. And then you use that to create a reuse commons in cities. So the idea in this last part of the research was to think not in terms of a blueprint, but a, but a way to weave systems that, uh, in which general cities could be possible. I identified some of the policy areas, some of the uh, aspects that I wanted to cover with that. And then the idea of commons, there are many ways or many descriptions and many, a lot of good literature being uh, uh, written still today about commons, mostly inspired by Eleanor Ostrom's work. And this, this is a, a, a very summarized way that I found in this book that has these principles, these eight principles that can help in creating uh, or in establishing this uh, the commons as a way to govern uh, collective action um, and collective, collective resources. So I created this toolkit that is called the Reuse Commons, which is basically is not uh, that elaborate and it doesn't have to be. And I guess it shouldn't be elaborate because the idea is that it can be applied to any neighborhood, to any city uh, or even to larger organizations, to different contexts. But the idea is first to identify on a map what are the potential stakeholders and the potential uh, sources of materials, equipment, knowledge, time, uh, volunteer that could, uh, th that could contribute to create a reuse commons. So this is a picture of this first mapping that I did in Dundee. And you see there are, for instance, shops, uh, retail stores, tailors, shoe repairs, um, what else there is in the map? Uh, bike repair shops, phone repair shops. So the idea is to first identify in which places materials are being reused or are being kept uh, or diverted from the waste stream. And then on a second layer, we create profiles of these different actors and identify what kind of uh, things and materials and knowledge they have to offer, what kind of requests or what would they want from this commons, what do, would they want from the, par, the, 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 the fellow common members, uh, what is the history, so what have they done in the past, and then what kind of data they generate and they are able to share, uh, and there, there's always this negotiation about what kind of data is useful for others and what kind of data is sensitive, so uh, how much you have to discuss that. And the idea of creating data is also to try to rebalance uh, power dynamics that sometimes are not uh, are not in favor of people doing things for the betterment of local societies. And finally, we have trigger cards 
in order to elicit discussions. So you create this way to see a system and then you bring these cards in order to promote discussions that will help uh, this, the, the stakeholders create their own protocols, their own bylaws, and even try to create policy and uh, proposals for legislation to implement these common-based uh, reuse systems. Um, this is pretty much what I have to present about this part of my research, the reuse commons. There will be uh, documentation available online on the website reuse.city, which is outdated right now, but I hope to get back to it to get back to it in the coming months, possibly after I finish my thesis. So maybe in January the the website will be updated. And finally, I want just to thank my friend Gilda Godoy from Ubatuba. She leads the the, the, the cooperative of waste pickers, Coke with Compania, and she's always in need of help, financial and knowledge help. So if you, anyone wants to join and to help them there, please let me know and I'll be happy to put you in contact. So here's again my, the website in which I will document the research in the near future and my handle on Twitter. Thanks again for this opportunity.